Good morning. morning. Do you have a good first day? Awesome. More of you, I had so many people come up to me in the hall yesterday and say, did you really do an automated MDM enrollment yesterday, live on stage with an Apple TV, with a Mac connected to Azure, and then later a live uh, iPhone for a customer? Man, that was gutsy. And the answer is yes. And this morning, are we doing the exact same thing? No, no, no. I am way more relaxed this morning. Way more relaxed this morning. It was a good day to hear Jamf and Apple and IBM and SAP and Microsoft all working together to write code for you and make your life easier, ideally. Uh, That's a good thing. And our theme, of course, yesterday was eliminating step three. We know we always have a journey. We always need to improve upon that process. Today's theme is a little bit different. Today's theme is devices with a purpose. Because most of the implementation examples we were using yesterday is all about deploying Macs and iPhones and iPads out for the purpose of user productivity. It's just workers just like you and I who want to go out there and be more productive. But some devices are not just intended to help the person get work done. Some devices have a job to do. They're actually built for a specific reason. See, I take all users and I sort of think of them in three big categories. There are your productivity users, again, like you and I just wanting to be more productive. But then you have your frontline users. They're on the front line of working with customers to accomplish something specific. And then you have your consumer users. Well, we all know what a consumer is. But these consumers are users who are using a managed device, but they don't work for the organization that's managing the device. Within a school, of course, a teacher would be a frontline user. The student would be a consumer user. Within a hotel, for instance, the staff member that's delivering something to the room would be a frontline user, and the person staying in the room would be a consumer user. It applies to almost every industry. And this morning, I've got a super easy job to do because all I have to do is introduce awesome presentations. You're getting five for one this morning. We are going to do five awesome mini presentations within one event in five different industries. The industries are K-12, high ed, healthcare, hospitality, and retail, all that deploy devices for a specific purpose, largely between those frontline users and those consumer users. Because not only can those use cases transform somebody's productivity, those use cases can transform an industry, can transform an organization. And we are going to see some visionaries who are actually transforming industries. And of course, we're going to start with the industry. You're not supposed to have a favorite. But there is one industry that's been very close to Jamf's heart for a long, long time, and that's K-12. And we have just a fantastic presentation I would like to welcome to the stage from Sawanaka Central High School District, uh, Rob Pontecorvo and Brian Messenger. Thank you. Good morning. Hi there, I'm Rob Pontecorvo. And I'm Brian Messenger. Once upon a time, we were two happy teachers. <laughs> now, I'm coordinator of classroom instructional technology and student achievement for the Sawanica Central High School District on Long Island in suburban New York. My business card, this long. <laughs> and I'm the coordinator of mathematics. What that means is I'm pretty much responsible for 80 math teachers in grades 7 through 12. But we're teachers. I still teach classes. I make parent phone calls home about my kids. I even recently became the advisor to an after-school student club. And that was my happy world for about 30 years. Suddenly, about a year ago, something happened that thrust me into a world of Skype, Slack messaging, WebExes, Zoom conferences. Suddenly, I was conscious of other countries' time zones, international holidays, so that I would be more considerate of their cultures. It's gotten to the point where my department argues to see whether I'm more like the international man of mystery or whether I'm more like, where's Waldo? What changed in my world? Well, pretty much the same thing that was beginning to change in my students' world. Instructional technology is no longer a novelty. 
As the world grows smaller, connected in every way with emerging technologies, we are presented with both a series of opportunities and challenges. It would be educational neglect for Rob and I to ignore this world around us and not prepare our students for these new realities. So our district's instructional technology went from zero to 60 faster than a Ferrari. Not too many years ago, our tech department was changing out light bulbs on overhead projectors. And now teachers cannot live without robust Wi-Fi and an Apple TV in every classroom. My department has three full-time employees, and we successfully manage over 9,000 iPads as part of our Apple one-to-one -one program. Mm -hmm. This is for me. We're in year three of this program, and we're so excited to have introduced MacBooks to our teachers this year as well. Success on this scale would not have been possible a few years. Gone are the days of tethered carts. Gone are the days of manual Apple ID creation. Automated MDM enrollment into Jamf makes it easy for us to onboard students, as well as refresh our advisors, all with zero-touch IT. We're also very, very grateful to have a great team at Jamf behind us. Shout out to Ben Dennis, Josh Roscos, Jesse Dunn, Zach Colvin. They provide us with incredible support every day. Yeah. And even though, even though Rob and I have been evolving through educational changes for a combined 45 years, I started teaching when I was three. The one thing that has remained constant in our, is our shared focus on students. That has never wavered. So one day, when Rob came to me about some new thing called GeoGebra, I knew it had to be something important. I think I'm OK, right? All right. Well, the New York State School Report Card lists the Sawanica Central High School District as having 2,816 students that are economically disadvantaged. That's about 34% of our population. But the details behind those statistics is what's most startling. You see, we consist of five junior-senior high schools that service four very different communities. If a student doesn't own their own calculator, we give them one to use in class, but go home at the end of the day without the help of or the practice with that calculator. As an example, to point out the differences between our schools, last June, one of our high schools during the New York State Algebra Regents 1 exam had to lend out three calculators for students to borrow. One of our other buildings had to lend out 300 calculators. That represents 300 students in that building that did not have the use of that calculator throughout the school year to do their homework, practice their studies, and study for exams. In a school district that demands equity, that's unacceptable. Okay. Shortly after our district started our one-to-one -one iPad initiative, Quite frankly, I found it comical seeing a student walking down the hallway with a beautiful new state-of-the-art iPad in one hand and a graphing calculator that hasn't changed in almost 25 years in the other hand. The more we researched an alternative to our $110 standalone calculator problem, the more we realized that even our students that own their own calculators were at a disadvantage. You see, other districts had evolved through various much more expensive calculators than our district owned. If a student had their own calculator or used the ones in class that we provided, they would actually be at a disadvantage and behind other districts and the students that used their more modern devices. Now, there have been some amazing graphing softwares developed in the past. But historically, teachers have been very hesitant to use these in instruction, having to only take them away during a state exam. Our challenge is to bridge the gap between high-quality instruction and assessment. The GeoGebra graphing calculator is the tool that we are using to build that bridge. This powerful and beautiful tool is available for free. It's available to all our students on their iPads 24-7, regardless of their economic status. Apple, GeoGebra, and of course, Jamf are enabling us to enhance student learning in ways that we've never been able to do before. And our teachers are leveraging this higher student learning on high-stakes New York State tests. Using the tools on the New York State Regents exam, our kids will achieve higher than they ever have before. And this is just one, this is just one part of the solution. Forgot about that. <laughs> but of course, to support all of this GeoGebra project, we need to pay attention to many, many details. 
For example, to ensure the integrity and security of a New York State paper-based exam while every student has an iPad in their hands, we're working with Jamf to perfect a configuration profile and workflow to lock students into their GeoGebraGraphing calculators. Without physically touching a single device, we can make that happen with several clicks of a mouse. Technology is not an obstacle. It is an enabler. And GeoGebra is only one example of how we're using technology to remove obstacles and enable our students. This year, our district is fully embracing Apple's new schoolwork app, combined with the existing power of the classroom app. Rob's teachers and teachers throughout our district can monitor students' classwork, distribute and collect assignments in a paperless classroom. With these apps, we have increased the ability to differentiate and personalize instruction. Projects are starting to replace traditional exams. iMovies are infiltrating all subject areas. And schoolwork and classroom are providing our teachers and our students with a seamless classroom infrastructure that promotes organization and minimizes the necessary tasks of distributing documents, keeping students organized and on task. Schoolworks allows you to create assignments, monitor progress, and provide feedback. So I gave Rob an assignment. I created a class, made Rob my student, and I created an assignment to finish the JNUC 2018 keynote. I asked him to submit a video of his students welcoming everyone. So now on Rob's iPad, he saw that he had an assignment from his teacher, me, and I wanted him to upload a video. He recorded it, shared it, and then I, as the teacher, received an alert that Rob had completed his assignment, thanks Rob, and I could open it up, check the work, and share it with all of you. They're very excited. They probably didn't know what JNUC was. <laughs> schoolwork is helping us in many ways, but within an hour of Apple announcing schoolwork, we leverage Jamf to automatically install it on our over 9,000 iPads, and our teachers and our students immediately had the newest and best tool available. We did that with our three-person staff, and none of us had to touch a single iPad. And we offer many tools to the teachers and students in our district. But we believe so strongly in schoolwork and classroom that they are the only tools that we trained this year's crop of new teachers on. And here, and this is very proud for me, this is one of our first year teachers who was my student when he was in high school. And he is using nothing but schoolwork in his classroom. His seventh graders have been fully immersed in learning with it since the first day of school. But to truly use an iPad as a transformative tool and to give it that immeasurable value, you have to have it do something that could not previously be done in any other way. Hey, Brian, hold this tennis ball for a minute, would you? Sure. Now, even our seventh grade students will learn how to find the volume of a sphere. And you know what? Every good math teacher has probably cut themselves trying to cut a tennis ball open to show the students the radii of the sphere. All right, you can take it away. But how many teachers are able to simply remove the top of the sphere and have their students look down inside to examine that any radius is the same? And we can even, if we wanted, I guess, let's try this out, put our students inside the sphere by putting the top back on it. Never have we, been, or never have we had tools like this to allow our students to get this perspective the volume of a sphere from inside. And this sort of creativity is just one example of what makes the iPad truly transformative in the classroom. The one skill that we cannot teach is creativity, and we are so excited that Rob's example of GeoGebra AR is just one of many examples of our creative approach. And we're so excited with Apple's new Everyone Can Create curriculum. By allowing students to express their own individual creativity, they are developing skills and a confidence beyond what is typically seen in a classroom. Take one of my recent students. She was struggling severely with her academics and her self-confidence. She refused to write essays in my social studies class. She failed most exams and was really quite lost. Once I allowed her to sketch visual answers to written tasks, she demonstrated a mastery of understanding that exceeded my wildest dreams. She was understanding she just needed a new way to express it creatively. 
Over time, this built her confidence, and she wound up dramatically improving her academics. That's a device with a purpose. We came across this stock image from our friends at GeoGebra and felt it was truly representative of our technological journey. It may not be the most direct method, but it keeps leading to higher things. And you have to admit, it's quite beautiful along the way. The path to the next level may not be a straight line, but it could be a beautiful journey filled with new opportunities around every bend. You know what? For our students, their classroom will never be the same. And for two lifelong teachers like Rob and I, we never could have imagined that our classroom would look like this room. Thanks for having us here today, Jim. And thanks for supporting our students along the way. That was a great presentation. That was awesome. I'm feeling a little emotional. <laughs> Wasn't that outstanding? What an amazing presentation. As an old uh, mathematics major, uh, how I would have loved to, to gotten my hands on, on that kind of a tool when I was studying math. Now, K-12, in many ways, this notion of devices built for a purpose, uh, K-12 has really uh, led the world in connecting, uh, you know, teachers with iPads and then the consumer users with students. But other industries are picking up on it as well. Uh, specifically, last year, we had Marysville University here, and they were talking about a one-to-one -one program they were doing at the university level, which is not done very much at the university level today. And when I saw that presentation, I thought, gosh, I wonder whether you know, a major national university will ever step in and do this kind of deployment. And it was just a few months later that I read a story that The Ohio State University was going to start to deploy or roll out iPads to their incoming freshmen. A university of the size of The Ohio State University, public university, and I thought, man, i got to learn a little bit more about that. And what I found out as I looked into it was this actually was just one small piece of a larger program called the Digital Flagship Program. And to introduce you to that, we have just a short video. Digital Flagship is an Ohio State initiative committed to providing access to innovative teaching and learning resources, preparing students for the modern, mobile, technology-driven workforce. In summer of 2018, we began with the deployment of technology kits to all incoming first-year students. Each iPad Pro included Discover, an app made by Ohio State developers in collaboration with Apple that provides curated information about digital literacy, campus involvement, degree planning, wellness, and more to help students acclimate and thrive at Ohio State. By fall, more than 11,000 kits were in the hands of Ohio State students, and it's only the beginning. This year, a mobile iOS design lab will provide hands-on learning opportunities to the Ohio State community, and self-paced online coding curriculum will enhance the career readiness of students without increasing cost or time to degree. The road ahead is incredibly exciting. It will not only set Ohio State apart as a leader in educational technology and higher education, but will empower the next generation of curious, innovative problem solvers. I was fortunate enough uh, earlier uh, this summer to actually be able to go down to the Ohio State University and see the rollout occur to the students. It was absolutely amazing. It blew me away. It is my great pleasure to introduce to the stage CIO of the Ohio State University, Mike Hoffer. Thank you. Thank you so much. How's everybody? Let's try that again. How's everybody? Good, good, good. Thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, so w why are we doing this and why is technology important in higher education? Um, if you don't know, higher education isn't great at change. And the example I use all the time is that, you know, we, we dress up in medieval robes three times a year and hand out paper diplomas. Um, I look great in my robe, by the way. I'm just letting you know. Uh, <laughs> But we have to change because the world is changing and we're preparing those students that we have to work in this world. Um, if we believe the data, 7 million jobs will disappear by 2020. 85% of the jobs in 2030 haven't been 
developed yet or identified yet or invented yet. We're preparing students for a workforce that we don't know what it will look like. We don't know what it will be. But we think technology will be the driving factor behind that. And we have major gaps, right? We have gaps that um, where um, we have computer science myths, we have coders, people that are coding, um, but not enough. Um, if you look at the statistics here, 546,000 plus open computing jobs nationwide. Computer scientists entering the workforce last year, 49,000, right? We have to create other pathways for students to um, be able to solve problems differently. Um, so uh, we created our digital flagship program um, about a year ago um, to start to address these initiatives and help students be more successful in their in their learning. So you heard a little bit about this in the video, video uh, student technology. Our technology package is an iPad Pro, a pencil, a case, a keyboard, and care for that device for their time on campus. When they leave campus um, and graduate from our institution, they get to keep that device. Um, coding curriculum for all students and app development, and we'll get into those in a second. Um, so this is one of our, our classrooms. This is the OHIO there, as you can see. Um, you can see the students there with their iPads. This is McPherson Hall, if I rem remember correctly. Um, and this is a chemistry course. Um, we did a pilot with this group before the actual rollout. And some of the things we saw were improved note taking, better retention, um, more organization of class content, ability to write on slides and readings and share those with classmates and their professors. Um, we did a cheaper version of the textbook in this class. We went to a digital version of the textbook. $250 for the chemistry textbook, $20 for it on the iPad. So uh, we saved or each student $230. And then, <laughs> thank you. I could tell which people have kids in college, but who is, who is clapping. Uh, <laughs> But, and then getting away from printing, we, we charge students to print in our labs, and um, this really gives them the ability to get away from, from, from printing and moving forward. Um, this is a, another one of our faculty members in a, in a smaller section here. What we also learn, though, that is we believe these students are digital natives. They are digital natives. They, they use technology in every aspect of their life, but they don't know how to use it in education. They don't know how to use to solve problems. They know how to consume. They know how to play games. They know how to stream video. And we think it's our goal to help them grow these marketable skills so they can be better in the, in the workforce. Um, one of the really interesting things that we did, um, and this is a really cool picture, this is um, a classroom in one of our innovative classroom spaces. So if you're a faculty member, you have to go through one of our trainings to actually be able to use this space. You just can't come into this innovative space and lecture, right? Um, but this is in one of our oldest buildings, Palmerine Hall. And here you have one of our oldest buildings, Palmerine Hall, 1910, beautiful building, just redone with this modern way of teaching. Um, and uh, we, we went into this um, class we work with students, we work with Apple to create something called the Discover app. Um, in that app, they have all their student organizations that are available. They have a, a scheduling tool where they could build out schedules. We, we know that the way to save students money um, is to graduate them faster, right? So if you're not there for as long, you don't have to pay as much money. So they're able to build multiple schedules when they could take classes, share that with their advisor. There's checklists in there on what vaccinations they need and what they need to bring when they come to orientation and, and such on and so forth. And all of, all of that information lives and, and is delivered to them through, through the iPad. Um, we really think about coding a little different, I think, at Ohio State than a lot of folks. And I would love to have my computer science faculty chair up here with me, too, because he, he, he echoes these sentiments. Um, you know, computer science is a long path, right? It's a long path to degree. There's theory in there. And we need those people. They're going to develop the, the next greatest things. But we also think that every single student should have a foundation in coding. Um, to solve problems, to address issues that they see in society, and we're going to do that. So every student on their iPad gets the coding 
curriculum through the Swift Playgrounds. Uh, we all will be launching our own Ohio State curriculum to lay on top of that in January. Um, and then this November, we will be launching the first piece of a mobile app design lab strategy. Um, we will have a bus, uh, a 29-foot bus. It's the largest bus you could drive without a CDL license um, that will be around our campus, will be around the state of Ohio, and will be at our seven other regional campuses. We not only have our Columbus campus, but we have people out across the rest of the state, as well as we have an extension mission through our agricultural college in, in all 88 counties of Ohio. So if you're in Ohio, look for the big coding bus. Um, stages two and three of that will be a um, permanent lab on our campus and potentially a partnership with our science center downtown where we'd be able to do these coding things with the public as, as well. Um, so how did we do this? Um, 11,500 iPads, pencils, cases, and keyboards. Um, we announced this at our board meeting in September, October, and May 30th, was our first session of orientation with 250 students coming in the door. Um, I'm happy to say that we did not lose a single piece of equipment in this rollout. Not a single pencil, keyboard, case, or laptop was lost from shipping to deployment. Um, and you'll see as we get into this video how we did this for 250 iPads a day for almost 60 days straight. Digital Flagship is one of the largest one-to-one -one device implementations in higher ed because we believe in the access and opportunities this provides our students. Here's how we made it possible to get 11,000 devices into the hands of our newest incoming class. Once the purchase order was placed, the serial numbers were received from Apple, added to our point of sale system, CounterPoint, assigned in DEP and our CMDB, and pre-staged in Jamf. Then it was time for logistics. That means 11,000 iPads, cases, keyboards, and pencils delivered, confirmed, shipped to our distribution area daily, unpacked and kitted, and don't forget recycled, placed into 25 bins with 10 kits each, and delivered to our daily deployment areas. Meanwhile, a list of device eligible students was generated in the student information system, which triggered an email communication from DocuSign, directing students to sign electronically accepting their device. When the students arrived to pick up their technology, we checked to see if they signed their agreement using our Custom Service Now app, which scanned the device serial number and linked it to their account. After that, students set up their devices, signed in, Jamf linked to their student account, required a password, and they were ready to go. Then they downloaded apps from self-service, our main vehicle to provide students with software. Now that they have their devices, we offer tech support over the phone, in person, and online throughout the time they are a student at Ohio State. That's how we've managed more than 11,000 new devices at Ohio State. Um, so what's really interesting about this is my team, is, my, is any of my team here today? Where are you guys at? I know you're here somewhere. Uh-oh. Oh, hey, hey guys. <laughs> they, they came to me about four weeks before deployment and laid out the process, and the very first thing they said was, well, students are going to come in, and they're going to sign this paper copy of DocuSign, and I was like, no, they're not. <laughs> and... Um, you know, we didn't want to have the largest technology rollout in the history of our campus started by signing a piece of paper. Uh, <laughs> so we, we got that figured out, and um, you can sort of see, see how we walk through this here. You, you heard about this in, in the video, so I'm not, I'm not going to walk through the steps. Um, but it, it is quite a challenge. You heard Leave say in the video, that's Leave Yesvong, who's our director of digital flagship, 11,000 iPads. You keep hearing me say 11,500. There's a reason for that. Um, we had 500 more students than we thought we were going to have. Um, and that's not easy. <laughs> um, so think about that. That's two more days, right, that we had to do orientations. And that's 500 more iPads, pencils, cases, and keyboards that we had to have delivered, unpackaged, bag shipped, and, and through all the steps, you know, throughout, throughout the process. So um, 
I left support at its own side. We do provide support throughout the, 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 re the school year. We've only had, of those 11,500 students, eight students say they did not want them for various reasons. We only had like 50 things that didn't work out of the box. Um, so all less than half of a percent. Um, so it's been incredibly smooth. We had two technical errors in the whole rollout. Um, I have never, I have never done, I've been in IT for 25 years, I have never done an implementation of that size with so, so few um, issues or, or hiccups for the first time. Um, so here are some things we learned. Configuration profile management, we utilize multiple controls through JAMP to reach security compliance, whether that be a configuration change, password enforcement, or a lock screen message. Each configuration profile in JAMP should be unique, we think, because um, it serves a specific pur purpose and it makes it easy for us to determine then um, exactly what configuration profile does and if it's scalable and, and changes need to be made. Um, these are all pictures from our deployment, by the way. Um, OSU took an approach to the iPads that allowed the students to feel as if the iPad was untouched out of the box, while also employing necessary security measures. In regard to app deployment, most of our apps were made available in the Jam self-service portal that you saw um, for students to choose from. We viewed the Jam self-service as a, a curated sort of app store that students could go in and, and, and choose what they wanted to do. Most students have downloaded most of the apps at this point, we, we were able to see that. Um, and then asset management, a particular change that we saw with asset management was realized when we chose we were not going to asset tag each device. So this is another big move for us, right? In our old processes, every single piece of technology that we own gets one of those little asset tags on the back. And I said, I'm not doing that for 11,500. And we were able to work with our internal audit and our external auditors as a state institution and use JAMP and DocuSign to automatically do that through the process. Um, infrastructure expectations, we, um, 250 iPads a day over 60 days in the same space, increased Wi-Fi, we did um, a, a targeted rollout, we knew where those faculty who were teaching these students are going to be freshman year, mostly general education courses and increased Wi-Fi in those areas. We have a $20 million project to increase Wi-Fi across the whole campus going forward. Um, and then most importantly, it took a lot of awesome people, the folks in the back here who aren't on this picture, and these people here. This is Lee, her partner, Julie, and nothing says success like a cake. And I want to point something out. Um, Andrew in the middle, um, this guy right in the middle um, somewhere, um, he was our former undergraduate student government president. We hired him on as a full-time employee, and he manages the 20 students that help us with, with this program. So that's been really successful. Um, we're in month three. I have a couple examples of what student work looks like. This is one of our students, Allison Briggs, um, and how she's looking at surface area of a frustrum of a core. I'm sure our math teacher could tell us actually what, what that means. I have no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> this is Brittany Light. So she was giving a presentation on sort of uh, her love for Ohio State basketball. It was one of our welcome activities. And you could see these notes here that she took and the ability to add pictures and graphics. Um, and then this is Brianna Yonley. Um, again, you see this graphical representations of notes and, and how she's taking these here. So students submitted these to us and, and we asked them if we could share them with you and they said yes. So last really quick initiative is our affordable learning exchange. You heard about the one thing that we're, you heard about my one example of chemistry earlier, reducing the cost of the textbook. I want to um, show you what we're doing there through this program. I'm Darcy Hartman. I am a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics. My first year in ALX, I was working on switching over to OER resources for my large class that has between 550 to 700 students each semester. There was potentially a huge savings for students in those classes if I could find cheaper or no cost resources. The ALX grant allowed me the opportunity to take the time to really work on putting together uh, the materials that I was going to need. We estimated that by reducing the cost to zero, we were saving students about $220. I'm now in my fourth semester with the large class using the free textbook. So I have roughly altogether saved students over $600,000. 
So the price of textbooks is staggering. Um, just look at that for one second. Overall, the cost of textbooks and supplies for undergraduate students at The Ohio State University in one year is $61 million. I want that to be zero. Um, and we have this program to do that, and the ability to have all our students on one device helps us do that. You heard Darcy has saved 250000 You heard chemistry saving 250000 That's not just this year. That's next year. That's the next semester. That multiplies in and on itself. Um, we have already saved students over $3 million. Our goal is to save students uh, $20 million, $10 million by 2020, and then another $10 million by 2025. These are some of the examples of the textbooks that we're able to deliver to the iPad for free for our students. Um, it's just been a, a, an, an amazing experience, and I, I read this quote the other day that, you know, no story lives unless someone is willing to listen. And I'm grateful um, to all of you for listening today. I'm grateful to the folks at GM for having me here. I'm grateful, um, oops, I went too far, sorry, <laughs> to be able to tell our story because it's exciting. And I told Dean I want to come back in a couple years and, and, and show you what it looks like when all 65,000 of our students have an iPad. So thank you. So are there any Buckeye fans out there? There's got to be a few, huh? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned I was a math major, uh, getting emotional. I was also a computer science major. So I was getting emotional there as well because I just passionately feel that the gap between available jobs, especially now as somebody who's hiring computer science majors, the gap between uh, the hiring needs and the trained people, it, it's just too great. To see a university like Ohio State take that so seriously uh, is just incredible. Uh, if you really want to talk about getting emotional, as somebody who's sending three, three kids through college, lowering the cost of higher ed is, gets me really, really emotional. Um, the other day I was... I was speaking to a reporter who was interviewing myself and actually Martin Lang, who you heard from yesterday from SAP. And, and Martin, of course, is uh, rolling out all of their iOS devices in the Jamf cloud. And one of the questions from the reporter was, well, what would you do if you had to hire like 10,000 people really fast, like in a day or in a week or a month or, or something like that? And I thought about that for a second. I like. That's what schools do. You know, for all you businesses out there who, who you know, you got to hire people, you got to provision those devices. Could you imagine starting 250 new employees every day for three months? That's, that's the rollout that Ohio State University did. And I was on site, as I mentioned that one day, the notion that these kids, these 18-year-old kids, are coming in and they go to orientation and they're not given, nobody's standing over their shoulder telling them everything to click. Sure, there was support there, but all of that setup the, from the unboxing was just done by the students themselves. Truly amazing. Over the years, we have had a few transformational presentations at JNA. I believe Fletcher Previn's presentation three years ago was transformational in an industry. I think SAP's presentation yesterday uh, is going to be transformational in an industry. I think Mike's presentation about higher ed is going to be transformational in an in, 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 in industry. And two years ago, we had another one. We actually brought a friend from University of California, San Diego Health, to come talk about what they were doing within healthcare. Now, we talked about the you know, massive, fast provisioning of a devices that must be done in schools. But what if your employees, like, turned over every week or every day? day and you needed to reprovision of those devices for the next person that was coming in. I mean, that would be extraordinarily complicated, right? But that's actually what University of California San Diego Health is doing. It's an amazing implementation that have come up with some really cool tech for figuring it out. This program has advanced 
significantly, and we asked uh, him to come back and share what's uh, the latest and greatest in his uh, hospital uh, deployment. In addition, he will be joined by a Jamf to help tell that story. Please welcome to the stage from Jamf, Adam Mahmood, and from University of California, San Diego Health, Mark Silvestre. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dean. You know, Mark, it's been a couple years, as Dean mentioned, since you've been here. It has been. I uh, actually booked a flight last year. It was delayed till Monday, so. Yeah, and, you know, actually, this story oh, I heard we got is, more. I could try another one. Um, this, the story I heard is that you actually made Dean come down to see you last year. I, well, I did. Yes, that was great. Dean didn't come visit me in my office, and uh, he videotaped an interview that I thought uh, went well. So it was good. We enjoyed it. Well, we appreciate you coming back. Um, no, in all seriousness, can you give the audience just a brief recap of, again, what sparked the vision for this initiative? Sure. So, um, as many may recall, we deployed about 245 iPads to the facility that you see up here right now, Jacobs Medical Center. Preceding that, uh, this organization went through a transition of sorts to become a more patient-centric uh, environment organization. Not to say that we were ignoring our patients in the past, but there was definitely a focus on our patients as well as staff. Um, with the facility opening up, it gave us an opportunity with some technology to bring some of the latest and greatest to our patients. So we had done a pilot. We had piloted some Androids. And some of you may recall this from a couple years ago. Um, one of the things that we found challenging was the wiping of these devices. Uh, we were able to pilot with the iOS. We reached out to Jamf and said, hey, if you can help us with an auto wipe, uh, for us, it's a fairly easy sell. I will give a shout out to Eric Boyd, our Apple SME, who's here today as well, for really pushing this. He had to convince me. But once we uh, engaged with you guys, you guys were willing partners. And when we opened, we were successful in auto wiping our tablets based on, in the health industry, it's called an ADT feeder, an HL7 interface. So it's based on a discharge and a transfer. We're actually able to implement an auto wipe in our device. When we rolled this out, we wanted to provide a couple different things to our patients. One was room controls, so we can control the lights, the blinds, the TV, uh, and the temperature. We also wanted for the patients to be able to throw things up to the TV. So we have an Apple TV behind every one of our TVs in this facility. As we redo some of our other units, we are adding an Apple TV behind the TVs for those uh, uh, rooms as well. So we can take uh, greater advantage of uh, what Apple TV has to offer, frankly. So cool. So you're two years in. You know, tell us about the outcomes. What's the response been like from patients, from families, and even from your staff? So the patients have responded positively. Uh, interestingly enough, the day we rolled out, we didn't have Netflix on our iPads. Uh, just, that was more of a Netflix challenge. We got more complaints about not having Netflix than I've ever heard before. <laughs> Um, and I'm not kidding, we got a lot of complaints that we didn't have Netflix. So within two days, thanks to our technical team, we were able to get Netflix on our devices, and I could literally walk the halls and see the patients streaming Netflix up to the TV, so that was pretty awesome. Um, so it's been, re it's been received very well by our patients. Um, staff was a little slow in coming around. This was technology we were adding. These are nurses, they have a lot to do. Uh, so they were a little slow in, in, in coming around to the tablets. Uh, I think uh, since we've rolled this out, which was two years ago, by the way, next month, uh, our staff is starting to see the positive results that having a device like this sort of bringing that home to the health environment in the hospital, to the patient. I think they're seeing these results and are, um, uh, it's a, we're getting a more positive response from our staff as well. I will say we've been doing some numbers and um, we have discovered that our staff or excuse me, our patients are three times more likely to utilize the MyChart bedside app, which is access to their inpatient record on the tablet, um, when they're using our room controls. Patients that are using the room controls on the devices are three times more likely to also access MyChart bedside. So some interesting stuff that we're discovering with our uh, patient uh, community here. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Now, how about from an IT perspective? Uh, do you have any stats about how this has been operating at scale? Yeah. So one of our big concerns, as I mentioned, was the uh, wiping of devices. When we first did our pilot with an Android solution, we had to remote wipe the device. And in some cases, we actually had to have someone come up and wipe the device. That's a resource hog for us, and it's on many levels. There's a staff that has to make a phone call. There's someone that has to actually log in and do a wipe of a device. And there's some risk, inherent risk with that. Um, we are 
thanks to Jamf, able to wipe roughly, we're averaging about 50 device wipes a day in our Jacobs Medical Center, 245 bed facility. So since we have gone live, we are somewhere north of 32,000 auto wipes we have completed. And I want you to think about that for a second. That's 32,000 times someone's not making a phone call. That's 32,000 times we are eliminating any sort of risk of the wrong device being wiped. It's 32,000 times that someone at a service desk doesn't have to log into a system and try to identify that tablet and wipe that tablet. That is huge for us. And we have discovered that this is saving us roughly, just in Jacob's Medical Center, roughly 1,400 hours of uh, FTE time in a given year. So it's, it's been amazing for us, yeah. It's, yeah. yes, thank you. You know, I think Eric actually had mentioned that 30,000 mark to me a while back, and um, you know, of course, a lot of us here are excited by 30,000 automated MDM commands, I'm right? excited about that. <laughs> but 30,000 times that a patient has been given a new way to consume their care is just awesome. So what's ne next for Bedside at UC San Diego? So this has been so successful for us, our CEO uh, demanded that we roll out iPads throughout the rest of our hospital, uh, our campuses. So I am proud to announce that as of last week, we officially deployed 500 additional tablets to all of our rooms at the uh, medical center. So that's three separate campuses. We've had a couple of areas where there were some challenges, but for the most part, 500 new tablets, so we have a total of 750. So I want you to think about that for a second. We have now tripled the number of devices we have out there. So the 50 wipes a day we've been doing is now going up to 150 wipes a day. So just think about that for a while. That's an FTE. On the service desk, that's at least two FTEs that would have to respond to calls. So this makes it much easier, easier for us to make this sort of decision to move this forward. It's been exciting. It's an awesome journey. And you know, I think another thing that we're really excited about is how this is a positive evolution for shared deployments. You know, as you heard Dean and others speak to today, we fully embrace one-to-one, -one, and it's the best way to personalize an experience. But here you've found this way to customize the experience for a patient. And it's, you know, really also toying with the concept that wiping a managed device is an okay thing. It's not bad, right? And at the heart of that is what you referenced, Jamf Healthcare Listener, our EMR integration to Jamf Pro that can hear that patient status, if you will, and upon discharge or transfer, auto-wipe the device. You know, and we've been thinking about other scenarios like this too, where perhaps uh, a nurse or a technician might need quick, easy access to an experience on a device, but maybe just for the duration of their shift. And of course, we have some of the same needs. How do we ensure that their data is removed from that device and not left behind? Um, but I also think, as, as we've talked about, there are many scenarios where an automated solution like Healthcare Listener won't work. Mm -hmm. right? We need a simple solution to allow a user to take a stance in the process. And it was with that problem in mind that we developed a couple apps. So to tell you about these apps, uh, first, Jamf Setup, a simple way that a user can select the purpose of their device. This is all done over the air without any IT involvement. So to take a look at uh, the example, here we have an iPhone 10 enrolled into Jamf and staged with Jamf Setup in the dock. The user can simply open the app, and they're met with a pre-approved list from IT which has their roles or functions. And they simply make this selection, and that's it. The app will communicate back to Jamf Pro and reconfigure that device over the air. So here you see the necessary applications, the wallpapers, even restrictions available for that user. But again, what about the end of shift? How do we prep that device for the next user? Enter Jamf Reset, another application that is by far the simplest way to erase an iOS device. And again, all done without IT involvement. So that same iPhone 10 at the end of shift can simply be, again, we open up Jamf Reset, select the reset function, and upon confirmation, that device is wiped all over the air. Yeah, thank you. So Mark, UCSC has been one of our early beta customers testing these apps. You know, it was a couple months ago that we first spoke about them. Do you mind sharing with the group your initial impressions? Yeah. So when you first told me about this, I uh, was thinking, wow, this is one of those things that is probably unlimited as far as it's limitless as, as far as what you could do with this. Um, but you don't always know right away, right? And it reminded me of a time when I was trying to convince my wife we need to get a DVR. And she didn't understand why. So it doesn't make any sense. I'll never use it. 
uh, jump to today, and she has every episode of Real Housewives. She has the Kardashians. She has everything. So she is now seeing the value of this. And it's not to say I don't see the value. I actually <laughs> see the value in this. Um, so it was, it was a, um, it, for me, it was one of those things that just kind of hit me and said, wow, this is, this is, I can see a lot of uses. And for us, it was actually, it was perfect timing. As I mentioned, we were just deploying an additional 500 tablets, but we have found that there are certain cases where the auto wipe just doesn't fit. It does not work. And so uh, we needed to take a look at how we could um, add some value to our patients' stay with these tablets without an auto wipe. Do you mind walking us through the pilot use cases for Jamf Setup and Jamf Reset at your facilities? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, the way in the healthcare, the way a discharge transfer works is through an, a, an interface, an HL7 interface, which you guys with healthcare listener were able to take advantage of. Uh, in an outpatient setting, there's not a discharge or a transfer. So right away, we don't have a trigger point. And so in, say, an apheresis area or in any outpatient clinic, for that matter, we might want to offer them a tablet. In our case, we do. And Reset will allow us to hand them a tablet, and when that patient is done with treatment or whatever they're in the, the facility for, we can then take that tablet, do a reset, and that tablet is wiped and ready for the next patient. Um, we also have a situation where in our NICU currently, and I, uh, we have a NICU. Now, granted, babies are not going to be using a tablet. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least I don't think, maybe, someday. Maybe, yeah. But, Right now they don't, but their family members do. The mother, the father, whomever uses a tablet. In our NICU that we've recently deployed tablets to, it's a bay, it's, it's a room that's just got beds. So for us, it's difficult. We can't just put a tablet. Mind you, all of our tablets stay in a room. In this area, they can't stay in there. They're literally on a bed or a crib. We, we can't leave them in there like that. So what's nice is we are now, and this, we just started doing this last week, I'm proud to announce, we are able to provide a tablet, a bank of tablets, so that when the patient wants the tablet, we can use setup to identify the bed that patient is in, give them that tablet, they can use the tablet. Upon discharge or transfer, because these patients get discharged and transferred, it will automatically wipe. But the unique thing about this is that we can also take advantage of reset because in some instances, a family member might just leave that room, hand us the tablet back, but they haven't been discharged or transferred. We can do a reset and wipe that tablet and it's ready for the next patient or the next family member that comes in. And I gotta tell you, truth be told, we likely would not be deploying tablets to this area if it weren't for setup and reset. Because I don't want to change a workflow where we're now calling service desk just for a handful of tablets. So this, honestly, was perfect timing for us. I love it. Yeah. It's so cool. You know, as I mentioned, we first came to these ideas around end-to-end -end experiences, uh, perhaps for the shift worker, the nurse, the clinician. But it's so cool to hear how you and many of our other beta customers have parsed apart these applications and looked at perhaps how Jamf setup could be used for a new way to provision devices. Why not ship the devices out to field locations and let the individuals there choose their purpose? And perhaps that is a one-time function. The app could be restricted and never be present again. Uh, in retail envi environments, for example, why not hot swap your devices based on cyclicality or seasonality? Uh, take those back house training iPads and repurpose them for front of house line busting devices. Uh, as you mentioned, even in scenarios for patient experience where we have an automated solution, why not provide a secondary option to kick off the wipe with Jamf Reset? But if you really expand this out to any industry, what simpler way for a user to, again, remediate a troublesome device than erasing it and letting it re-enroll into Jamf Pro? Now, again, we mentioned clinical communications. Uh, I know this is an area that you've been looking into, uh, really precipitated by some challenges you had with an Android deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us more? Yeah, so when we op uh, opened up Jacobs Medical Center, we had deployed smartphones. Um, I won't go into all the details, but it was an Android solution, and we were fairly confident in it. Uh, since the rollout, we've just encountered uh, significant issues with our Wi-Fi, with audio quality more than anything else. Um, and so we have been spending a significant amount of time uh, trying to mitigate that. Got it. And so, you know, after the mitigation, or why don't you actually explain what those mitigation steps were? So we um, brought in, we've done some site surveys, we've gone through and made some changes to the device itself. Uh, we've moved WAP 
uh, devices. Uh, we've done everything that we can, and we've gone through and, and done new uh, pilots with the same devices and uh, have encountered the same challenges. Um, about a year ago, we decided to bring in iPhones for piloting. Uh, we did a pilot in an area where we mitigated our Wi-Fi challenges, and we did a pilot in an area where we didn't make any changes. Um, after the pilot, we had surveys for both our Android solution and our iPhone solution, and it was an overwhelmingly positive response on the iPhone solution. Uh, the audio quality was just that much better, um, even in the area where we hadn't done any mitigation of, as far as the Wi-Fi was concerned. So uh, we will now, after our pilots, we've made the decision, we are going to be deploying iPhones for staff devices um, in the next few months. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're excited. Now, I know we're early, but I have to ask, any ideas of where setup and reset could be used for that deployment? Yeah, it's, it is interesting, because we've talked about this in, in, in thinking about this. Uh, when you're looking at a nurse uh, on a certain floor, for instance, a NICU again, um, there may be uh, certain apps that they need to have access to that if they're on another floor in our BMT or, or our PACU, they don't need the same access. Uh, what's nice is we could deploy a bank of phones that they can grab. These are just phones for their shift. They could grab, identify their role, their floor that they're on, and use that device. Uh, the next staff member, the next nurse comes in, if they're not in, uh, a NICU nurse, they can identify what their role is, and the phone will be set up for them. It also will help us in remediation from a technical standpoint. When field services needs to take a look at some things, it's easier for them to identify which role the, the nurse was using. Um, our EVS, the people who come in and actually clean up the room, they need phones as well. They could grab the same phone. They're not going to have nearly the same apps that our staff would have. They can identify that role and then use that device as if it was their own personal device. So it's, uh, we're excited. We're excited about the opportunity. Again, I think this is perfect timing because we are just around the corner from deploying these iPhones. So it's great. Well, we're excited as well, Mark. We can't thank you enough for joining us again, and we're so thrilled by the innovation at UC San Diego. Um, one more thing, I'm really excited to announce to all of you that Jamf Setup and Reset are coming out of their proof of concept status and will be available to the Jamf Nation community very soon. So I'd encourage you to come to the 1.30 p.m. session, Jamf is Building Stuff, and get a deep dive from Michael Devins and Tim Knox as to what these applications can do for you. And at 4 p.m., visit our interactive lab, Shared iPhone and iPad, where you can experience setup and reset powering workflows for retail, healthcare, and even education. And then close it all out tomorrow morning. Eric Boyd from Mark's team will be giving a deep dive into, again, these applications alongside Jamf Healthcare Listener and the transformation they've had at UC San Diego Health. Thank you so much, and Thank we'll turn you. it back to you, Dean. Um, truly uh, changing an industry, uh, I mentioned that I do believe that that's another one of those presentations that has changed an industry, and, and that, those aren't just words. Uh, within a year of Mark providing his last presentation at JNUC, six of the top ten children's hospitals in the United States came to Jamf and asked us to roll out a similar patient iPad uh, uh, deployment using the same technology. So when the word gets out, amazing things can be done. And of course, you heard it from Adam, so mark your calendars on that date that's very soon uh, of when uh, those apps will become available, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. Um, one of the things I just wanted to mention, 32,000 wipes. What does that also mean? That means 32,000 automated MDM enrollments as well, because every time you wipe it completely, it's going to re-enroll for the next patient. Man, it's got to just work, doesn't it? Yesterday, I started my presentation off by saying we are able to go out and meet some very unique workflows thanks to Apple services that are available. And automated MDM enrollment is one of those automated services, you probably know it as DEP, that just works. And as a result, we're able to trust it to create a shared iPad or shared iPhone environment. So then adding setup and reset to the equation, you have the ability, just think of the amount of workflows that you could 
apply to your specific industry where you just take a device at factory settings and load up setup through automated MDM enrollment, choose the use for that device, have it automatically, you know, you know, everything automatically downloaded, and when it's done, reset it and use it for another purpose. That is a reuse that will actually save people real dollars. Now, one of the things that Mark also mentioned is he's deploying out Apple TVs throughout the hospital. Now, one of the, I just ran along this very recently. I just want to bring it up for show and tell. Um, this was recently built. This is for anybody who is frequented a hospital, you know that this is a pillow speaker. And this pillow speaker is actually created a partnership between Kerbel, who's the market leader in pillow speakers, uh, and a partnership with Monsiers, who is actually a Jamf and Apple partner. And this pillow speaker is very special because it was created specifically to control an Apple TV. And just think about what, and what it means by pillow speaker is you know how a hospital room works. It's laying up there on your pillow so that you can hear it and it doesn't disrupt the other patient that's in the room. But you're also able to control the Apple TV with a remote. So imagine the guest experience that can now be created in a hospital. Because do you really want to watch the television stations that you typically get at a hospital? Or do you want to recreate your living room experience? And that is what the Apple TV has the potential for doing. Now with that said, uh, with all due respect, um, Mark, I don't want to be a guest in your fine hospitals. Uh, I really don't. Uh, I think it's awesome what's doing, but I'm hoping to actually stay out of one of those beds, if at all possible. Um, but there is another industry that I am very pleased to frequent as a guest, speaking of creating guest experiences. And I'd like to get to our next uh, speaker today, and that is uh, from Red Lion Hotel, the CIO, please welcome John Edwards. So let's start for those that are not familiar with Red Lion Hotel. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about Red Lion? Sure. So um, Red Lion Hotels, um, over the last four years of fast-growing hotel organization, we've moved through 100 hotels, usually predominantly in the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. to about 1,500 hotels now um, throughout the U.S. and Canada. Um, so quite a bit of growth there. Mm -hmm. um, we've got uh, a number of brands that scale an upper mid-scale market um, to an economy market. So a lot of different types of guests, a lot of different types of travelers, a lot of t different types of uh, devices coming in our hotels. Mm -hmm. um, and and a, in a, at a frequency um, that I would, I would love to have the frequency of, of even Healthcare to some extent, <laughs> right. right? So frequency of daily, uh, yeah. many times. Yeah, absolutely. And so you said 1,500 hotels. Any idea how many rooms that represents? Um, we've got over 60,000 rooms. Um, oh, so a lot of different rooms, a lot of different room styles, a lot of different uh, geographic areas, right? All kinds of different scenarios. Um, so we've got, and, and then we've got, you know, we've got, um, we've got one brand, the Hotel RL brand, that really focuses around. Um, the technology experience. It's really our incubator brand. So uh, 60,000 rooms, that's at least 60,000 guests. The turnover, you're turn right, daily as a frequent traveler. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, the experience obviously very important to me. Do you want to just describe your vision a bit? I'll call it the, the guest experience from, uh, you know, the time that uh, somebody might make a reservation to actually the point that they're checking out. Do you have a specific vision for that? Yeah, so we, um, you know, the, the industry as a whole, as, as all of you are, are travelers to some extent and, and all interact with my industry, um, you know, you, we've all seen the industry kind of move forward with technology and, and what that means and, and what that looks like. Um, our vision is really around um, how do we make technology simpler for the guest, right? How do we make that um, the, the, the experience for the guest, memorable, um, maybe through uh, just an easier experience. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of focus, um, as I mentioned, in our Hotel RL brand um, with, and within our loyalty platform around, you know, can we give a guest the ability to, to check in, via, make a reservation clearly within our app, but then they see the reservation, they can check in through the mobile app, they can get their digital keys, they can actually skip the front desk if they need to. Um, and we see all kinds of different um, use case scenarios there. Um, and we've, we've had really interesting, some fantastic stories that have come back from, from our hotels that, have, that are using the solutions where guests are saying, look, I'm checking in from an airplane and my kid's sick, I'm on the plane, can you help me when I get there? And we've got these great 
really great hospitality stories um, where the technology has really enabled us to say, how can we help you make your experience here better no matter what the situation is? Um, so whether that's, hey, I, I, you know, I've I'm driving to the hotel and I can't figure out how to get there. That's a very common scenario. How do we help them in real time, text messaging, messaging through the app, uh, messaging through the solutions, Um, and then post-departure as well too, right? Many of us have left a hotel and forgot something, right? And that (laughs) happens a lot. And most of us say, I'll never see that again, right? Right, I lost my glasses, I'll never see them again. Um, But giving people the ability to stay connected to the hotel even when they leave um, and say, hey, I forgot my glasses. Can you send them to me? And yes, we can, we can deliver that, and we can start to improve that experience even after So they're that. interfacing with you through their mobile device prior to, not just to create the reservations, prior to the arrival, throughout the stay, uh, after it as well. Do you have a, um, so I mean, again, was it 1,500 uh, properties? Yep. Um, how do you, I mean, do you just come up with an idea and deploy it to 1,500 properties, or where do yeah, you try so, and implement your vision? Yeah, we really focus on, uh, as I mentioned, the hotel RL brand. So our RL brand is our incubator brand, and we have about a six or seven um, RLs right now, and that mm-hmm. brand continues to grow. Um, but the, the essence of that brand is really a technology-focused brand. Um, it's a unique experience. It's a very open lobby. Um, there's no front desk. Um, we have, um, we have a, a living stage at this brand where um, the, truly by, by the name, the stage is alive. So every night there's different performances on the stage, whether there's a musical or poetry or political activist or whatever that might be. Um, and so the, the, that brand is where we really try to roll out new things. And what does this look like? And how does it work? And what's working well and what's not? So from there, then we roll out through some of the other brands. Um, as, as as the application makes sense with that brand's voice and, and who that brand really is and, and that type of guest. Um, and so one of the things we've been rolling out quickly throughout the rest of this year is, is that, that mobile connectivity and that mobile communication through the rest of our upscale brands. Um, and then we'll, we'll continue to roll that out through the economy segments as well. And so then as a guest checks in, of course, actually we are, I, I suppose it stands Everybody. to reason that we're 100% travelers here since we're all at an event. Uh, so let's just, for all of us, if we were, if and love the Hyatt. I'm, I'm the, sure. <laughs> um, if we go, went back to our room, but we are in the Red Line Hotel where you're implementing this vision, and we have something to request or something to the, a service that we want from the people who are working uh, at the hotel, what does that experience yeah, look like? Yeah, so if you're, if you're a loyalty member and you've got the app, right, it's a very, um, a very familiar experience to anyone that's using a smartphone. But the mm-hmm. challenge is for a number of guests that maybe aren't loyalty members, um, mm-hmm. or they may not have the app yet, or, or how do they get, you know, it might be a, a, a family, right, where we've only got one device that's on the app, right, and we haven't got the other one yet. So really, how do we take that next step to say, okay, how do we get the rest, how do we include all of our guests in this entire digital experience and this entire digital strategy. And what are you using to do that? Yeah, so we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're in the process right now of rolling out Apple TV at our Hotel RL Baltimore. Um, mm-hmm. We're really excited. We've got the top two floors in kind of a pilot phase right now um, with a lot of success. Um, we've worked really hard to figure out, um, you know, in the app, in, in a, we all know in a mobile app, right, you've got access to a keyboard and I can move through that app and, and I'm familiar with my device. Uh, but now we've got this Apple TV solution where we've got to make some changes and we've got to adjust what's going on a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, the ability to, uh, to, to scroll through and find a keyboard on an Apple TV remote isn't the simplest thing. Um, and so we're working through that. We're working through a lot with um, and getting guest feedback. We're, we're partnered uh, with Moncierge um, as our integration partner and our app development solution um, and really working with them to say, okay, how do we take what we know is working in the app? How do we get in the Apple TV experience? Um, but then at the same time, we, we started, you know, as we started to go through the project, we said, well, wait a minute. The biggest challenge we have is I've got TV coming in, let's say, input one, and I've got Apple TV in input two. Um, and how do we manage this experience, right? How does, how does this look? What, how, do I, how do I make this seamless for the guests? Because the last thing I want is for an input change not to work on a TV, and I can't get one way or the other. Um, and so over the last nine months, I would say, we've really worked hard to figure out how do we integrate our TV experience into Apple TV? Would you like to see it? Let's go ahead and bring up the uh, Apple TV experience at Red Lion Hotel. Uh, and this, again, is the app that you're using is Monsieur's, correct? Yep. And so you'll, this is actually, if you're a guest uh, in the Red Lion Hotel and, and the, uh, where they're rolling out within Baltimore, of course, anybody that uses Apple TV at home, you're familiar with the interface, right? And I'll just, you know, really quickly scroll through these, but we'll take these one at a time 
and I'd be curious to get your vision. So starting with, I'm a guest, I sit down, I'm like, we were actually, I asked, I asked to, to stage this stage with a bed so we could actually simulate more of this would like, but uh, our marketing team thought that was weird. Uh, so <laughs> we decided not to do it. Uh, well, with that, so we're, let's pretend that, uh, that we have these nice loungers. And I just clicked in on properties, uh, just to give everybody another look at that. I'm on uh, features, actually, within the app. And just describe uh, what your intent yeah, is so, with this. Yeah, so, you know, everybody that's staying here at the Hyatt, I'm sure, knows that you've got an in-room compendium, usually on the desk. It's a paper copy. And this is really the digital version of that compendium. Um, but the concept really is, where is the pool? Or where is mm -hmm. the fitness center? And what are the hours? And how do I get there? Um, and how do I move through the property? How do I learn what's going on within this hotel and within the brand? Um, and the property feature section really gives us a, a much more feature-rich um, type of content delivery solution so that our guests now, um, it's not just words on a page, right? right. But they get to, a chance to see what the fitness center looks like or see um, what the features of the hotel have. Awesome. And then uh, I noticed, I can't imagine this would be the case in, in every hotel. Maybe it is, but events. Uh, uh, yeah, you so some you know, many over, hotels yeah. have events right going on like this, right? Type of, mm -hmm. I mean, imagine the same scenario in, in uh, or this solution within this property, right? You can see what's going on within your event. Um, it's very specific to our, that individual guest. Um, the room knows who the guest is in the room, mm -hmm. or the Apple TV, I'm sorry, knows yeah. the guest in the room. And so they know what events you're signed up for. So if you're here for the, the JNUC conference, it'll, you, it'll, it can show you that event listing and what's going on, what rooms you need to be in when. Very cool. Now, this is interesting, and you can imagine. So, uh, uh, John mentioned that they used the Monsieurs app. Now, just so you can remember what that, Monsieurs is actually an app, it stands for My Concierge. And it couldn't uh, come to life more than this area of recommendations. If I click on it, how often do you go down to a concierge and ask for things to do in town? Do you want to just describe what yeah, you're Yeah, absolutely. Here? So we, you know, we use this in our app today with, with with very good uh, user experience, but the Apple TV just brings this to life even more. Mm -hmm. um, and so the concept that I can figure out what I want to do tonight or what's in the, the area, um, we constantly curate this list, um, ourselves plus Monsieurs, um, and work through you know, what's available when, what are the hours of operation. If something's seasonal, make sure that the guest does, knows that it might close early. You know, right. Those types of things that a concierge usually you know, would provide, right? and they know all of these things. From the digital aspect, we, we all know that's out there. We can Google it and find it. Why can't I just deliver it through a, through a, a much richer experience on the Apple TV? Uh, and I just have a question, and I honestly don't know the answer to this question. So here I am. Uh, you know, clicking through this, and first of all, <laughs> I'm hungry, uh, but do you think that this could actually get to the point, because we've all ordered room service, might I actually get to the point that through this Apple TV experience, I could order food from one of these places? And of course, we're seeing, because this is being implemented in Baltimore, this is actually the content yeah. uh, that you're deploying. Uh, might you actually evolve this to where we could order right through this interface yeah, as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we all know the, the, the sharing economy and, and, and the di different uh, delivery mechanisms that mm -hmm. are out there today. Um, and we're, we're actively working with uh, or talking through some of those solutions with them to say, what does it look like if I can, if I, you know, could I charge uh, an Uber Eats to my guest room, mm -hmm. right? And what does that look like? How, how can that change the guest experience yet again? Phenomenal. And then this last step here, request which uh, we, we talk about the whole Monsi, Conci, my concierge concept, go into request and the ability, all of the things that you call down yeah. to a front desk, how has this changed just because obviously this doesn't have impact on just the person making the request, has an impact on your staff. Oh, absolutely. So how, do, how does that right? all work? So, you know, as we've started to roll this out, we, we, within the app and Apple TV both, we've started to, to see, um, one, we get a faster request from the guests, right? So we don't lose those requests any longer where they call down, it might be on a piece of paper yeah. or whatever. Um, we don't lose that anymore, we've digitized that, but, but to start to see the analytics on the back end um, has been significant, where we've seen annual conferences that come, or, or citywide conventions that come in annually, um, and we know uh, there, there are aspects of the operation that knows that they need to, they need to change when that's coming. Mm -hmm. But now we see the analytics and we can get way ahead of it. Uh, a fantastic example, actually, um, in one of our Spokane locations, um, they, they, needed, um, they had a, an annual conference where they had a big sporting event and the rooms always requested more towels. Um, and so as we started to lay this in, it seemed rather obvious, but in retrospect, the hotel was able to get it way ahead of it and say, we need, we need to stock up on towels because they always ask for more towels. 
Um, and so just being able to deliver that faster and then change that guest experience has really been great. Awesome. Now you started, before we brought it up, you talked about the, the, just the notion of watching TV. Of course, the TV is one of the most used uh, devices within the room. And uh, as I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, a lot of times you're, you're within the Apple TV, but you might want to go, you know, leave the Apple TV environment to go channel surf, but you wanted to keep things very, very simple for your guests. So you have this Watch TV app right within here that jumps right into a, a channel. And just to show you all, I played with this a little bit because I had it in, I actually went to my room with it and connected it up to my TV. And I was, I was actually quite enjoying it <laughs> last night. Um, and uh, the ability that you have here, working with Monsieurs to, um, you know, let's watch some Sesame Street. Uh, I, that's the danger of showing this uh, demonstra uh, demonstration. <laughs> we lost I had no everybody. idea what was going to be on TV, right? <laughs> um, how did you pull this off? Because I didn't sign on to anything. Right. We didn't pre-sign on to this. This is just streaming these channels right within the Apple TV. Yeah, so one of the this? biggest challenges we had when we started to, to work through this was how do we deliver terrestrial TV over the Ethernet to the Apple TV? Um, it's not a it's not a out of the box feature, if you will, with Apple today. Mm -hmm. um, and so, by partnering with Monsieurs as well as um, some other integration providers um, on the Directv platform, we're able to deliver Directv satellite to the hotel. We're converting that into Ethernet and actually streaming that um, live to that room channel by channel um, through an app that we developed it together with them. And it meets all the encryption requirements and all of the, the challenges that we've had in the past. Um, the cool part for us, too, is we didn't have this massive bandwidth increase. Um, bandwidth for us is a, is a, is a, is a commodity that we really got to manage um, because of the number of guests and all of the different devices that are using the internet. Um, and we really wanted to focus on how do we deliver you know, really fast channel change, as you saw here, oh, right? How do we deliver a really quality signal um, over that traditional satellite service or, or, or cable, uh, depending on the TV. What's required in the room uh, to be able to do, uh, like, so you have the Apple TV in the room, you have the Apple, what else is required in the room? The only thing we require right now, we have the Apple TV and then we've also done custom remotes. So we, you know, we did a pilot program with mm -hmm. the Apple TV remote um, and found that, you know, if you're really not familiar you're with not Apple, you're using this right? remote within your We're, remote. We, yeah, we're not today. Um, and so we're working through different iterations of that remote. Um, but those are really, that's it. So we're, we're, we're just taking the TV that we have now, adding the Apple TV, the, the remote, and we're off to the races. Awesome. And then as I uh, uh, go down on the uh, main menu, right below it, you have something called Living Stage. Now, this is completely unique to Red Lion Hotel. Why don't you describe Living Stage and what you're doing with the Apple TV? It is, absolutely. So we, um, as I mentioned, the Hotel RL brand has a Living Stage. And so the concept really is that, that four, or five, six times on a week, um, we have an hour or two hours of block of content at the hotel that our guests can mm -hmm. enjoy or, or, or uh, members of the community can come and enjoy. Um, and at the same time, we've worked with um, how do we, how do we we live stream that today in the hotel, but then how do we record that and, and get that back to our guests that want to see um, previous content or they see future content? What's going on with that artist? Uh, many of our artists um, have um, all kinds of different followings and, 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 and groups that really um, watch them constantly. Um, and so how can, we, how can we share that experience for these performers um, and, and improve their experience as well as our guest experience? And so we're, we're in the final phases of really launching this app within the Hotel RL brand um, so that all of our Hotel RL rooms will have this app and have the ability to see what's going on with the living, with the living stage. Awesome. Now, we, we have some uh, apps up here that you're all familiar with. We heard about Netflix a little bit earlier uh, from Mark, and, and right now, these streaming apps you're not deploying, we put them there, though, to have a conversation about them because obviously they're very, now with the ability to deploy apps uh, with tvOS and the new management capabilities that are available, you can really, from the App Store, push any apps you want. Um, and of course, back in the day when you used to check into a hotel, it was a treat because that was the one spot you could rent movies, you know, for $40 a movie. Uh, <laughs> but today, what we want is we want to pick up the show that we're binging at home from the very spot that we picked it up. But there's a challenge when it comes to actually signing on to your account within our hotels. Just describe that a little bit. Yeah, so we, um, we, we've, we continue to, to work through this in the lab. And right now, we're, we're right at the cusp of getting the apps out there um, so that I guess can log in. But again, you go through that same challenge with how do I log in and what's my password? If you're like me, I don't, remem I don't ever remember my Netflix <laughs> password. So I reset it every time I get a device, right? <laughs> and that's a horrible experience. So how can we give our guests the ability to log in from home? 
um, yeah. and bring their login with them. Um, and Jamf is really the, the piece that's starting to bridge all that together. Um, and so when we look at deploy, a real-time deployment of these apps and those, those, the personal payloads down to that Apple TV through Jamf is, is massive. Um, when, we talk, we, we, when we start to talk about changing in the industry and that experience, because many of us have casted right from an iPad or an Android device or a laptop yeah. to a room, but it's just not the same experience of being able to just turn your TV on and hit play where you pause the night before. Yeah. When you were watching the presentation earlier and you saw the Setup Reset app, did any of that apply to you? Absolutely. <laughs> right? And I see it in iOS, and I'm, I would love to talk about how do we get that in tvOS, because our guests want to see that reset, right? Again, it's the same experience. They want to know, right, My, I was watching this. I want to make sure it's gone. Um, and we do that for checkout today, um, but giving the guests the ability to manually do that would be massive. So what's happening is just like within the hospital, uh, this Apple TV wipes between guests completely and reloads, which does bring you the ability uh, to be able to personalize it for the guest. And I was just talking to John the other night on the phone, and he's like, oh, man, what I would really like is one of those buttons where I could just have, because the guest wants to have confidence to completely wipe it. Uh, and I thought, okay, you know, it was one of those moments, and of course the team will kill me when I go, well, go back in the office, and I just was like, doggone it, we're going to do it. I'm not going to go through the planning process, but we're going to take that iOS reset app and we're going to bring it to the tvOS uh, as well. So uh, just real quick, uh, you've been rolling out to the guests. Um, what kind of feedback you've been getting? Um, it's, we're getting good feedback, um, but it's different, right? So we get a lot of guests that come back and say, ah, it's great, but it's just so different, right? I'm trying to get my head around this. Um, and they're only there for a couple of nights at the most, right? Most of them. Um, and so we're, you know, the feedback's coming hot and heavy. Um, and it's all very, uh, it's very constructive and very positive. We're working through, you know, with any pilot, we're working through some of those challenges. But the TV part works great. The, the ability to cast from an iPad or from an iOS device oh, works great, right? Yeah, so right. That's, that's huge, right? It's all within your own private network. So that's, it's definitely a work in progress, but it's, it's, uh, the guest feedback's been really positive, and they've been really excited. Let me just ask this audience, if you did check into a hotel and this was your interface, uh, would you like it? Yeah, yeah, it'd be pretty cool. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Um, I, for one, uh, would, as a matter of fact, I can say this factually, uh, since I brought this very Apple TV uh, to my room the other night, and I was trying to figure out um, what I uh, uh, was going to do or fall asleep to, because I generally turn on TV uh, when I fall asleep at night, and all of a sudden I thought, oh, wow, no, I actually have this in my room, so I quickly hooked it up, and I just enjoyed uh, the Red Lion experience, even though, I, maybe I shouldn't say that here since I'm in a different hotel. I enjoyed that experience, uh, even though I wasn't at a Red Lion hotel. Well, those are four of the five industries um, that we wanted to present to you today. We still have one more. When, you know, all of this, you'll notice that, again, these managing of these devices at this point where the person who's working with the customer and the customer themselves, in some cases, are using the devices, you need a consumer experience. Because if you don't provide your users, if you will, a consumer experience, they have the ability to seek elsewhere to do their business. And of course, no industry knows that better than retail. And so our last presentation is going to be a retail presentation, which is absolutely phenomenal. And because I don't know how to pronounce Yost's last name, I'm just going to introduce to the stage from Jamf, Jenny Asava. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I actually practiced Yo's last name, so when I do introduce him, I hope I get it right. Um, are you guys enjoying Janok? Right? I love coming here to tell these customer stories with you guys, and I'm going to start with a question. So whether you're here in the room or you're upstairs or you're watching at home, mom, I want you to raise your hand if before today and before reading our recent case study, if you had heard of rituals. I see like two, okay, like five hands here if you got, for you guys at home. Now I have to admit, I'm in the same boat as you guys. Before I got a call from my colleague in Amsterdam, I had never heard of the brand, not, not once. Um, he was shocked, by the way, and I'm sure everybody watching in Europe is shocked right now, too. But I, I did not know that they were one of the fastest-growing 
home and luxury product brands in all of Europe. And I certainly didn't know that I would have the opportunity to share one of the best customer stories with them this year. So to help me tell that story, how they're using Apple, Microsoft, and Jamf, both in their corporate office, but also in their retail locations that are in nearly 700 stores across 27 countries. Please help me welcome Joost van der Swan. <laughs> so good to see you again. Thank you, Jenny. I'm gonna pop right <laughs> over here. Now, Joost, last time we spoke, you told me that you guys were deploying devices, opening about two stores every single week. Is that still the case? And if so, how in the world are you doing that? Because that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jenny, great to be here. Um, yeah, we are still opening uh, two stores every week. Um, to open a store, there's a lot of IT involved. Um, first of all, uh, um, we use uh, Jamf, uh, business uh, Apple Business Manager and Jamf mm -hmm. Self Service mm -hmm. to accomplish that. Um, uh, yeah, the iOS devices are very simple to enroll. Uh, we sent out the devices uh, shrink packed and uh, sh shrink wrapped mm -hmm. uh, to the stores. Um, when they arrive, it's, it's all going automatically. They unbox the device, uh, log in with their Active Directory credentials, the device gets enrolled, and yeah, uh, yeah there we go. So that, that's really Great. simple. Yeah. And you're using three different types of devices in every Rituals retail store. So each store gets an iPhone couple iPads and iPods as well. And I, I wa want you to tell me about the use cases of each of those. We'll start with the iPhone. Now, I know you previously said that if an empl a store employee, for instance, has to go somewhere that doesn't have Wi-Fi, that's where this comes in. So they'll use their iPhone. Um, but I'm really curious to hear how about the iPro, the, the, um, the iPad, and the iPod. Uh, and if you could tell yeah. us the use cases of those. Which device do you want to start with? <laughs> Let's start with the I iPad. OK, the iPad. Yeah, uh, the iPad we use in the back office. Uh, it's a good uh, size device for the, for the back office. Mm -hmm. uh, they can do their daily tasks, like uh, reading their email and these kind of things. But it's also used, uh, we use SharePoint uh, uh, as a platform for Microsoft. Okay. They can see there their um, uh, weekly newsletter, uh, the company trainings, uh, order equipment for the back office. All these kind of things can be done on that, on that device. Great. So, yeah. Great. Now, what about the iPod? The what iPod, that, that's a more uh, device for uh, in the front of the store. Mm -hmm. uh, we use that for several uh, kind of things. Uh, the iPod is used as an, uh, a CRM device, okay. uh, but also as a uh, device for uh, a mobile point of sale. So uh, throughout the store, uh, like I think everybody knows in the Apple Store uh, mm -hmm. how they do it, we use this device in the same mm -hmm. way. You can make payments with the customer yes. uh, uh, to buy anything uh, in our store. Uh, yeah. And uh, last, not least, we have a skin analyzer. Mm -hmm. And that device, uh, I brought it with me, <laughs> small device. Mm -hmm. uh, we use that uh, to yeah, measure the skin uh, of a customer, uh, yeah, yeah how, how the quality is. So uh, you want to see how it works, maybe? Yes. Yeah, yeah let's <laughs> yeah. give it a shot, right? So what, <laughs> okay. what, uh, what kind of information is this going to show? Um, yeah. <laughs> right? uh, it's showing a little bit the texture and the quality of your skin. But I think you, it will be fine. Great. All right. <laughs> yeah. Let's give it a shot, yeah, No problem. It, uh, yeah. it makes uh, a, a few okay. yeah, detailed shots Let's of your skin. Let's take a peek, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I very nervous. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I, I, those of you in Minnesota, you understand the moisture part here. <laughs> good thing I know where I can get some really good lotion. Um, I, I'm very glad this says 100 points for Colleen. Thank you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a very different presentation. Um, great. So this is really interesting. So to sum up your implementation at your retail stores, you're using the iPods, the iPhones, the iPads. You're also deploying MacBooks to all of your employees, whether they're in your corporate office or they're spread in different offices throughout yep. the world. How in the world are you making sure that the right apps get on the right devices to the right people? Yeah. 
uh, for the stores we use there, uh, of course, the smart groups, uh, GEMF, uh, so the, so the smart groups. Uh, we made a kind of configuration uh, per country per role. Yeah. So each device has its own role. Uh, um, let's say in the Netherlands we have some type of applications and in the America we use different kind of applications. So uh, we set it up all in the GEMF uh, smart groups. Uh, the only thing they need to do, what I said, unbox it and it gets their, uh, their applications. Uh, so that, that, that works for you very well. Great. Yeah. And so my friend Adam, a few minutes ago, he introduced Jamf Setup and Jamf Reset. You guys have had the opportunity to test this out for a few weeks. Yeah. So I'd love to know uh, what's your feedback on those new features. And then do you think those features are going to really aid in how you are getting content out to your retail locations? Absolutely. Uh, we were uh, happy to, uh, to test this uh, Jamf Reset and uh, Jamf Setup. Uh, it was for us a little bit uh, how we used the, the smart groups but now it become really professional for us. Um, we loved uh, the solution. Um, we are already really piloting uh, the, the solution. Um, what we can do, let's say we have the skin analyzer on a device, and one day uh, uh, in, in a very busy time of the year, yep. for us that's Christmas. Uh, we don't need the skin analyzer because we don't have a lot of time for that. And we can reset the device and deploy it as a uh, mobile point of sale yeah. because we need more mobile point of sales uh, at that time of the year. Yeah. yeah. So we mentioned a lot about the shops now, but you're truly an all Apple shop. You're also using all Apple devices in your, um, in your corporate office. Can you talk a little bit about when and why did Rituals decide to move to all Apple in corporate? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, first of all, we love the, yeah, the brand. Uh, the, yeah. the Apple devices are uh, yeah, luxury items. Uh, we see them as a luxury thing, and it really fits our brand as well. Uh, we started, I think, in fall of 2016 mm -hmm. with a pilot of 20 or 30 MacBooks, and uh, the feedback that we received was, was awesome. The people were, thinking, uh, were saying that the devices are flexible to use, easy to learn, and very stable. So that was uh, a huge su success. Uh, after that, everything went really fast. Uh, <laughs> we deployed, I think, in the same year, around 650 uh, MacBooks. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, iP the iPads for the back office, also around 650, 700. Mm -hmm. um, the iPods, uh, we, uh, we ordered around 1,500 at the first batch. And that was uh, really uh, a, a good choice. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything worked like, the, like it should work. And two months ago, we uh, uh, started to do deploy around 1,700 iPods again for the stores. And that was a huge success. I think we, as an IT department, it took us one day, ordered the stuff, send it out, and uh, yeah, the de deployment was done. So that was I'm really awesome. I'm going to recap uh, awesome. that for a second. Yeah. He said, if you guys didn't understand, <laughs> 1,700 devices in one day. Yeah. So congrats on that. Yeah, thank I mean, you. That's <laughs> awesome. Really great. Right. Now, throughout this entire process, I, I sat down. I got to visit you guys in Amsterdam earlier this spring. And I talked to you about, you had a previous MDM that you were using, and you were looking for something different that would allow Rituals to really scale. Because you guys knew this growth was coming. You wanted something that would allow you to scale. Um, so you, you evaluated a lot of different platforms, of mm -hmm. course, to, yeah. did your due diligence. And I sat down with your CTO, and I said, well, Nico, now, can you tell me why, ultimately, did you decide to land on Jamf? Can you read for me what his response was? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, the Rituals and Jamf relationship began in 2016. We were looking for an MDM, and both Microsoft and Apple suggested Jamf. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? Yeah. Yeah. So as a writer, this quote makes me extremely happy. Um, I did want to touch more on the use of Microsoft at Rituals. So if you could tell us a little bit more about how you're using it to achieve productivity in the office, that would be great. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, we not only use Apple devices in our uh, store, but uh, we have a, lo a lot of things. But uh, our software plot platform is running on, uh, on Microsoft. We're using uh, Office 365. Uh, each employee has an Office 365 license, and they can use the whole Office 365 suite. Uh, Skype, uh, OneDrive, uh, the, everything that's in there. Um, 
uh, one of the things is our SharePoint environment. That's a really important one for the stores. Uh, the SharePoint environment is used as an, a platform where they can find anything that's happening in our stores. So let's say, uh, uh, what I said, the training material, these kind of things. It's, it's a kind of intranet uh, uh, solution for our stores. Um, we are in, still developing that, but it's, it's, it's a, re a real good success. Mm -hmm. And we also think that the, uh, the platform uh, already really fits our uh, Apple device uh, solution. So th it's a great fit, I would say that. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So from Rituals, we've learned how they're using Apple, Microsoft, and Jamf to achieve an elevated shopping experience for their customers, as well as a better overall working environment for their employees. Yos, thank you. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now, I know you all thought that was the end because Dean told you only one more thing, but I asked him, I, I kind of begged a little bit. I said, Dean, can I have three more minutes? He actually gave me two, um, so we'll see how quickly I can do this, but I want to introduce a little surprise to you all. So, as you guys know, whether, whether you're new to Jamf or you've been with us for a long time, we truly value our customers so much. Um, we, we believe that you guys are the backbone of our company and you are why we have seen the success we have since we started in 2002. You guys do a lot for us. You speak at our events, right? You participate in case studies like Yoast did. You give us product feedback and you come to our events. Look at you all here. So whether you're here in person or you're tuning in online, we are so grateful for all of the participation that you guys give to us. And while I really hope you understand how sincere all of our thank yous are, I'm excited to let you know that we now have a new way that we can thank you. So with that, I am super excited to introduce you to Jamf Heroes. <laughs> So Jamf Heroes is a platform where you all can share the Jamf love, because we love to do that. Um, you can get a first look at ebooks and white papers that we release. You can give us your input on our company and on our product. And you can really just engage with, with each other in a new way and, of course, earn rewards. Because who, who, who here likes Jamf Swag? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of it, right? You guys like Jamf Swag? So whether it's getting Jamf Swag or uh, donating to charities like Girls Who Code. There are a variety of rewards within the platform that you all can get. Um, just as thank yous for doing the things that you guys are all doing. Now I want to take a quick moment to thank the top five Jamf heroes who have been super active in the platform and who have really helped me get it ready to announce it to you all today. Each um, one of these five people will receive this exclusive Jamf Heroes backpack. You guys like it? I picked it, so I really hope you like it. <laughs> Good. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with number five. I had to practice these names, too. Tysic Flair, he's watching from Europe. Congratulations, Tys. I will mail you your backpack. <laughs> yes, surprise. <laughs> Yo's colleague, Niels Vanderstein. Congrats to him. He's got to be in the room somewhere. Josh Lagrange. You here? Congrats. And our number one Jamf hero for the year from Australia, so he's either watching or sleeping, is James Smith. Thank you. I'm so appreciative of all of the work that they've done. And if you guys think, wow, Jenny, that sounds really exciting. How do I become a Jamf hero? Number one, you're all Jamf heroes. <laughs> but if you'd like to come into the program, um, you can go actually into your JNOC app right now. There's that cute little face in there. Uh, if you guys, did it come up? If you guys can see it, yep, oops, sorry. And you just click right on that. If you're watching remotely, go to this website fill out a quick form. That lets me know that you're interested, and then I will send you an invitation to come on into the program. Now, I do manually approve every single one of these, so give me a little bit of time, um, and then we'll get you guys in and get you active. So thank you so much, everyone.
Um, I also think you're all heroes. Um, I had the same reaction watching uh, the presentation uh, from Rituals as I did watching the presentation from SAP yesterday. Here you have a couple of organizations who are deploying a massive amount of Apple devices and both using, you know, Office 365, you know, from Microsoft to be able to deploy content and run their business. And I'm thinking, you have these two incredible enterprises and both Apple and Microsoft are really happy about what they're doing. Uh, 2018 is just massively different uh, than, say, 2001. Uh, I'm always reminded uh, of that quote from Ghostbusters, uh, Bill Murray, uh, talking way back. I'm talking about the old Ghostbusters, you know, cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. You know, uh, when I look at these presentations, so it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, also, I started the presentation off yesterday talking about this notion of IT efficiency and unified endpoint management and all of that. You know what? Uh, sending out multiple devices to nearly 700 stores and having IT not have to touch any of them and having the ability to redeploy them and have the users just own doing that with setup and reset and IT never having to configure or touch them, that seems really efficient from an IT perspective. Um, so I just, I applaud all of you for how you're leveraging the most of what we're trying to provide you. And I guess I would like to leave you with just one reminder today, you know, as we've been talking about the users, the patients, the students, the guests, the shoppers, you know, these people don't work for our organizations. They're consumers. If they don't like the experience they're getting, they can go elsewhere. But the truth of the matter is, so can everybody else. Every user you serve and we serve should be thought of as a consumer. They can take their business or their employment elsewhere if they want. So if there's a wish that I have is that we'll work together this week and we will serve you when you all go home so that we can all serve your consumers in the best possible way. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our speakers. Have a great rest of JNOT. See you at the party tonight.